I think we're going to go ahead and start. Um, I, so uh, today we have Amanda Robertson with us. Um, she's the Farm Service Agency, Beginner Farmer Regional Coordinator for Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, she focuses on uh, uh, beginner farmers and veterans. And without more introduction, I'm going to let her go ahead and start. Okay, thank you. It's nice to be here with you all today at the University of Tennessee. I've been trying to get down, so thanks to Aaron Smith for getting this lined up. So we appreciate that and appreciate the opportunity to be here. So if you all have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to stop me to ask questions. I'm very laid back. We'll just make this a, a very simple uh, step, and hopefully you all will walk away with a, walk away with a lot of helpful information about USDA and the programs that we have. Um, as been said, I am the Beginning Farmer Regional Coordinator. So my primary focus is on beginning farmers, but anything that I cover throughout the presentation applies to any farmer, to anyone of a, you know, that's farming, has an operation, they're looking to get into farming. Um, if you're a beginning farmer, you just receive incentives and priorities. So this initially started with the 2014 Farm Bill, and it gave USDA new tools and flexibility in several of our key programs that we're going to go through for today uh, to be able to assist beginning farmers. So as we start the presentation, you may be asking yourself, who is a beginning farmer? anyone who has not farmed for more than 10 years. So for example, um, if you all are sitting here in the room and you grew up on a farm, you farmed with your parents, um, a neighbor, anyone like that, you all could still qualify as a beginning farmer, although you may have been involved in it your entire life. So um, just if you have um, not conducted business in your name for over 10 years, that's something that we keep in mind as well. Um, as we move forward and we think about our loan program, uh, another part to that definition is the individual cannot um, own real estate that exceeds 30% of the average acreage in the county where the property is located. Um, and a lot of folks, you know, as we talk about this, you may think, how on earth am I going to know that? Well, we have got a little guide uh, at the Farm Service Agency for Farm Loan folks. They can easily access that. They have a chart with every county listed in Tennessee with the average acreage and then 30% of that acreage. So uh, that's not a huge deal, but just a little bit of information we like to throw out there because that can get a little tricky uh, when we start to think about our loan program when folks can take advantage of the beginning farmer incentives. So what USDA is currently doing to support our new and beginning farmers, we're focusing on creating modern, flexible customer service. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit as we um, talk about some new things that have emerged. But um, folks like to have things at their fingertips right now, whether it's through an iPad, um, a mobile device, and we're seeing our farmers even become more involved in that. You know, we, we hear quite often that they're out there farming or they have a full-time job, they're farming in the afternoons, and deadlines and important information that they need to be aware of, it creeps up on them and they miss out. So some uh, the programs have been designed to assist with that. One of those is FSA Farm Plus that we have at the Farm Service Agency. And that program allows individuals to pull um, the maps of their farms up um, to check out their uh, tillable acreage. A lot of times producers just come into our office and they want to have a map of their farm. And so how they even get that map to start it with as, as soon as folks purchase land, you need to take your deed into the Farm Service Agency. And they'll ask for name, address, social security number, telephone number of the owners of that property. So they'll gather that information, put it into our system, and then they will delineate out your property from that deed, and a survey is always helpful too. And that way they establish a farm serial number. So you know, as you're conducting business through USDA, that farm serial number is a golden key um, that everyone has to have in order to be eligible to participate in programs. It's a requirement that's there. So through FSA Farm Plus, um, and I'm a new pro program that's been designed, you can access all of that information from your phone instead of having to go into the county office or, um, you know, call them up and ask them. You can access that yourself. In addition to that, in 2014, USDA launched for the first time a single front door to all USDA programs. And this website is very, very helpful. We refer folks to it all the time. 
And it is a website that um, a lot of our websites today have useless information on there. However, you can tailor this website to meet your needs. You can choose your state, your county. It, there's options for new farmers, young farmers, women in agriculture, veterans, land in transition. Uh, because it's been noted that over the next five years, 10% of the land will change hands. So as you choose the category that you like to view and uh, something that fits into your operation or if you're looking to start an operation, uh, you can find it there and helpful resources will come up. So it could be with Cooperative Extension, it can refer you to a university, to another USDA agency, or whatever the case may be, that can be found there. And in addition to that, uh, we have farmanswers.org. And this website was developed through a partnership with USDA and the University of Minnesota. And it's a little bit more detailed uh, for our folks who are up and going and uh, looking for some more insight uh, to things, maybe more so than just the new farmers website. So here we have text alerts. So the Farm Service Agency, as we talked about, you know, people needing reminders for um, the deadlines and important uh, signups that may be going on at the local office, they can now receive text alerts. And it's not something that just overwhelms your phone with text and things like that, but it notifies them, I think they receive two per month of important updates and deadlines. So everyone can do that. So for example, they would text their state and county keyword. So if you are in Tennessee, it would be like capital T-N, Humphreys, or the county, uh, or Humphreys, Humphreys County, and you text that to FSA now, which is 372669. So from that, our farmers then are incorporated into a system, and those text alerts are, are generated to them for them to access. So as we think about that, the Farm Service Agency equitably serves all farmers, ranchers, and agricultural partners through the delivery of effective and efficient agricultural programs. So I like to say that the Farm Service Agency touches a farming operation from the time that it begins, if it even ends. It's an ongoing process, but um, the Farm Service Agency can be our farmer's best friend. And our folks who work there, you know, we encourage them, we encourage our farmers to build relationships with those individuals because they can really, really help them um, throughout their operation. So first of all, uh, the Farm Service Agency we provide folks with money to purchase land and get their crops in the ground through the Farm Loan Program. As you can see, we love to use acronyms, so we've got acronyms for all of our programs pretty much, but we'll try to explain what each of those are. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about the Farm Loan Program in just a moment, but uh, we have direct and guaranteed loans, direct loans, uh, operating loans are in there, uh, and also farm ownership loans to help them purchase the land. So once they've got their land, they've got their crops planted, they come to us for a reporting system. So here farmers file acreage reports. So for example, if you're a row crop farmer, if you have corn, tobacco, soybeans, uh, you come in, you say, I've got 50 acres of corn in this field, referring back to those maps we talked about. And then you mark off and say, well, I use 20 acres for hay and pasture. So all of that's marked on a map and we enter it into a system. That becomes a critical, critical point. And everyone has to have a certified crop report on file to participate in nine out of 10, the majority of the programs that are even offered. That's a number one requirement is to have a certified crop report on file. No matter if you don't grow crops, if you're not a row crop farmer, or if you've got, um, if you're a fruit and vegetable grower, um, we delineate out if you come in and say, well, I've got um, a quarter of an acre of sweet corn. I've got an orchard over here. You know, we still mark all of that up out and even if you don't have any crops at all if you just have hay pasture um, we still do grass reports because you have to have that on file to participate in programs and also it becomes very critical in times of insurance purposes we're going to talk about that agency in a moment but um, that acreage report is very important, report is very important. And then, once you've got your crops planted we have an insurance, an insurance that is very important it's the non Insurable Assistance Disaster Program, known as MAP, and that's for fruit and vegetable growers. Um, you cannot typically go to a regular insurance agent and get insurance on tomatoes, strawberries, watermelons, things such as that. So we cover that at the Farm Service Agency. Uh, by being a beginning farmer, uh, this incentives and priorities kick in here because normally there's a $250 administrative fee for that. Uh, if you're a beginning farmer, if you are an underserved producer, you get the, that insurance for free. 
And then if you want to improve that coverage and buy up, you get to do that at half price. So there are some things to keep in mind there. Um, and then once you've got your crop plan and you've got it insured, and at the end of the growing season, when it comes time for harvest, harvest if, you've if you've got more uh, of a commodity than you can sell at one time, or you're wanting to see if that market improves, we've got a, a way to help you store that commodity until you get it um, ready to go to market. And that is through the Farm Storage Facility Loan Program. Initially, this program was designed, program was designed to help our grain farmers uh, by, helping uh, by helping them to purchase and construct grain, grain bins to store their grain in. With the 2014 Farm Bill, we had some flexibility in able, being able to reach out to our fruit and vegetable growers. Now, um, you can purchase cold storage units and cooler trucks so you can adequately transport your product from farm to market through the Farm Storage Facility Loan Program. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Also, we have disaster programs. Um, here in Tennessee, the Livestock Forage Program has been huge because of the drought this year, or last year, rather. Uh, so that is when farmers can get compensation on the loss of their hay and their pasture throughout the year. So that's LFP. LFP, what we call LIP, is a lot of folks refer to it as the dead cow program, but that um, stands for livestock indemnity program. So if our farmers lose livestock due to adverse weather conditions, extreme heat, extreme cold, um, they need to keep records of that, and they will bring their inventory and their death losses into their local county office and potentially receive payment on their losses to help them recover uh, from those dead animals. And then we have ECP, which is Emergency Conservation Program. Just like yesterday, we had some bad storms. This uh, helps with tornado damage. Um, if we have a freeze, if there's a flood, things like that, it helps them to remove their fences, clean up debris, um, and things like that. And then at the end of the day, come have a seat at our table and let your voice be heard. We have what we call a county committee, or a COC. And those folks really, really are critical to the operation of the Farm Service Agency. And we love to have a well-rounded, well-diverse group of individuals. It is a nonpartisan election. And you can nominate yourself. Someone else can nominate you to be on this committee. Um, but we love to have beginning farmers. We love to have... Um, Cattle farmers, fruit and vegetable farmers, poultry farmers, women, um, underserved folks, folks of color, things like that to serve, to on, serve on our committee uh, because, because they, they do have to make a lot of decisions about our programs and they service a lot of um, diversified individuals. So, so our programs, we talked about the disaster programs, our commodity programs. Um, commodity, this falls into our ARC PLC program. Uh, so we have that in the past, it was known as the rate counter cyclical payment. Uh, this is if you have grain bases on your farm, um, you can, uh, now it's called a safety net program, and you can potentially receive payment um, on your, your base acres. And then conservation, we have a conservation reserve program, and there's a new program designed to help our uh, beginning farmers. If you've got a, a CRP contract, if uh, someone is involved in that, they're wanting to sell that to a beginning farmer, uh, there are some incentives and properties there. Uh, so some folks are taking advantage of that. However, it's limited to um, certain contracts or certain practices uh, that folks are enrolled in through the CRP program. So our farm loan uh, program, the direct and guaranteed direct loans, we can loan up to $300,000 uh, to individuals through our operating loans. Those are termed over seven years at Low interest rates currently for March, the interest rate is 3%. So um, if, uh, for example, someone has a, a cow-calf operation, they're wanting to purchase breeding stock, we can help them purchase those. And in terms of over seven years, same as if they need to buy a piece of equipment, um, we can help them with that as well. Then if they're a farm ownership loan, this is turned over 40 years. And we finance 100% on these third direct programs. So no down payments required, so that's huge because that becomes a great barrier for a lot of folks when they have to put up a down payment for, for land or even for an operating loan. But we're able to help them in that way because that's not a requirement. So our farm ownership loans, uh, one thing that I like to mention as I speak to uh, you know, universities, to schools, is we have a beginning farmer program, but we're going to ask you if you've got three years of farming experience. And a lot of people says, well, if I'm beginning, how can I have that? So if you're beginning out on your own, but if you've been farming, as I said, with you know your parents or a neighbor or whomever, if you've been conducting business, so if you buy, if, you, if it's a cattle operation and you 
Um, say they let you have a calf. You need to sell that calf in your name in the stock market. If you've got that ticket, you got a receipt. We can we can utilize, utilize that. that. If you, if you purchase feed for that calf, calf, we can utilize that. So keep up with your records. Or if it's a fruit and vegetable operation, you know, same thing. If you sell at farmers market, if you help someone and you know you say yes, this is my product, you know, sell that in your name. Not saying you have to go out and file a schedule F. You know, if it's a minimum amount, but just keep documents, keep those receipts, and you can utilize that when you go in to apply. Yes, ma'am. Um, how do I establish that I'm farming? So how do I like, I need to prevent people from just using this to like get a cheap loan? Land or something. Mm -hmm. Well, when you come in and apply for that loan, we're going to see that it's a feasible operation and that what you're wanting to purchase, I mean, you're going to be able to uh, cover that cost through the commodity debt, commodity debt what, your farming, you know, what your farming enterprise is. is. So you, so you can't just all, all of your income be non-farm non -farm income or it be so minimum that, you know, you can't cover the cost of the loan that you're going to be getting. Does that so make sense? Like, would have to show some kind of receipts for like, future years of where you're actually farming. No, so what, what are what are you asking? I'm not sure I understood what you were asking. So let's just say like I want to buy land cheap. I said I'm a beginning farmer, but really I work here at UT. Yeah. So how do you prevent me from getting a cheap young farmer loan? Well, I mean, are you gonna be are you gonna be buying a well, farm? Well, I just I own land and have somebody else custom farm it for me. Yeah, you could, but you need to be showing that you're actively engaged, you're performing managerial duties on that farm, and that you're actively farming. We're going to look for that too, but we have a lot of folks who do, you know, I mean, you have a full-time job, but it's still, you know, if you are, um, I refer back to a cattle farmer, I mean, if you've got a cow-calf operation, yeah, in the afternoons, we're going to be showing you've got your calves or your repayment to get your, to be able to make your payment for your loan. So I couldn't just be a landowner with somebody custom farming my land? No, you can't just hire someone to do it. I mean, you've got to be out there, too. You've got to be actively engaged in that. Is there a time constraint? Like, I just do it like, on the weekends or something? No. I mean, you could do it. I mean, yeah, you've just got to be contributing right. to it. But, I mean, we're not just going to – you've got to be <laughs> – Eligible. You've got to be the right down her name. <laughs> You've got to be eligible. So um, you know, go talk to your local. If you're seriously interested and you're looking to go, I mean, that's what I say. You know, I'm here to tell you about it. But when you know you get down to the nitty gritty, I want to know this and that, and talk specific about your operation and your ideas. I always refer folks to let because every situation is different. Yeah. Um, when you get into what it. resources are available? Like a couple of years ago, I remember um, we had some problems with a farmer that wanted to get a loan, um, uh, start out organic certified mm -hmm. for a number of operations. But then uh, the numbers, as far as prices he was going to get, they were not consistent with the three year transition period. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot react yes. to the price. Um, what resources do you have? for farmers because they have to come with a business plan. Yes. Aside from the extent, you know, do you have any other resources that they can access to have a feasible business plan? Because mm -hmm. when they came to me, that was not feasible. Yes. So, but what other resources you can offer them so they can do a feasible and realistic business plan? What we rely on is our folks from Cooperative Extension or from our universities um, with those to have prices and commodity prices. And yeah, the organics does get into be, being tricky because you've got that window. So we can't say, like if someone came to us to get a loan and their, their future plan is to transition but they're not certified yet, then we can't do those projections on their organic prices. You know, we're gonna do it on what it currently is. But yes, and we can work through the business plan with our folks because we understand it can be very overwhelming or, you know, we are um, at USDA, you know, air forms may be a little bit different than others. So we do, we sit down with them, um, you know, make an appointment with our folks and go over, you know, the business plan, um, the income and expense and things like that. So they're there to help you through that. I have another question from your previous slide. Um, the adjusters for the NAP mm -hmm. program, are those adjusters going into food and vegetable production? Because I've heard a lot story about that. Where are they coming from? And what training do they have if they come to a food and vegetable operation? They are, are trained. They, they do have a training process mm -hmm. to know the specifics of that. I do not. Um, because that doesn't fall into air specific, you know, they're trained. Are they employees of 
You know, I'm not sure. It's not, not shelter. Shelter. it's not something that we typically do. I mean, we don't, you know, train there in the yeah. Farm Service Agency, train them for that. Um, so, okay. yeah, I'm not sure. I don't work with them individually. I'm sorry. Uh, so, through the farm ownership, is there any more questions about that as we move forward? I guess I don't understand. If you're a beginning farmer, how can you have three years worth of experience? Yeah. Let's I mean, say, just say I was, I, I was going to leave this job and, and, and go farm. I wouldn't have that three years experience, but I'm a beginning farmer. Mm -hmm. According to your definition, I'm a very beginning farmer. Okay, so let me let me clarify. That is only to purchase land. That doesn't fall under the operating. So we can give you money to help you with your operating expenses. Okay, that's only for the farm ownership, and it has to be three years out of the past 10. And what we generally recommend to folks is that you start out by leasing land before you go out and you, you actually want to purchase to get your experience there. Um, and one year of college education can now be counted toward that three year experience. So then you have to have two years of experience. Um, and if, if it's agriculturally related, but yeah, we, we usually refer because I mean, it is a large undertaking. I mean, when you look at a large amount of money and we just say, you know, we've got someone who pops up who's never farmed before and yeah, we're giving you $200,000 at 4% interest. 4% is the, the interest rate for the farm ownership loan. Uh, you know, we don't want to set anyone up for failure, for failure either, although we like to promote it and get folks involved and let them, let them take advantage of the program and utilize it to the, you know, the fullest, but still, yeah, we're not here to set someone up for failure and it ended up in a bad situation. So, you know, there are precautions and that's just, you know, one of our regulations and our requirements. And as we're out in the Beginning Farmer Initiative talking to folks, we're trying to educate them and tell them that because, you know, some people come to us and they say, you know, we farmed all my life. And, and although, you know, even I was a farm loan officer before taking this position and I know people and I know that they know what they're doing, but if they can't provide us with documentation um, to, um, to meet our requirements, I mean, you still, you know, kind of. Uh, put you in a bad situation. So that's why we're trying to educate them and let them uh, provide them with ways to, to have that documentation when they get ready to purchase land so it can be uh, utilized. And then our guaranteed program, as I said, through the direct, we are limited at $300,000. So, for example, probably here in West Tennessee, like Western Kentucky, that $300,000 is not going to go very far for large farmers. So we have a guaranteed program uh, where we can partner with the bank um, or a, another farm credit, some other type of financial institution, and the government will get back that loan 90% and they will, will take the risk on it. Uh, so that's uh, something that typically a lot of our poultry farmers take advantage of because if you're up and going to the poultry industry, $300,000 is not going to go very far. So um, that's a program that we have as well. And we talked about farm source facility loans and the marketing assistance program. Uh, that comes into play too when uh, folks are trying primarily for our grain farmers uh, for them to take advantage of too. So, packaging programs. The Farm Service Agency is leveraging its footprints uh, across rural America to reach beginning farmers by helping to provide a critical one stop shop for USDA. So, here we have a program called Bridges to Opportunity. We're just currently trying to get this program up and going. Um, I think it will be a very good program, especially for our beginning farmers or anyone, but uh, we're going to be able to bundle resources and package them together. And by that, I mean, for example, if we have an organic producer come into our office, and they're wanting to know what resources are available to them uh, from the various agencies and how they can help. Uh, we'll be able to bundle those resources for them and give them to them at one time, uh, which we'll get into it a little bit later, but just for an example, um, at the Farm Service Agency, we have the NAP program. They will do their, do their crop reporting with us in NRCS. They have got a conservation activity plan, which is a, an organic process. It's a cost share available to them since um, it takes three years to transition into organics. And then through our sister agency of rural development, they have a value-added producer grant program. Um, so we can package all of those things together so our farmers are not 
spending their time researching various websites or going to various offices, we can give them that information all at one time. And so that's something we're working on doing as well as if someone comes in and applies for a loan, if they're a fruit and vegetable grower, at the time they apply for the loan, they're approved, they can say, hey, I'd like to do my NAP policy for this year. So and if they're a beginning farmer, we get to sign them up for free. So you can do various things at one time without having to go to various agencies or come back numerous times to the office. So that's trying, the, the direction we're trying to get this in. So the rule would offer, would you give the information on the program? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't actually handle the application. No, no. We would tell them, um, you know, tell them about the program and about the grant and give them the information, but no, they would have to deal with rural development. Yes. Uh, but a lot of our farmers, you know, they just um, don't know where to go to get in the information. Or, you know, they spend a lot of their time trying to research. So this just makes it easier for them to obtain the information and then they can be provided with the correct resources. So the National Agricultural Statistics Service, this is a division of USDA who is very, 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 very important uh, to us at the Farm Service Agency and very important to our farmers. A lot of people do not realize that, but it is very, very critical that NAS surveys are completed and that they are completed correctly. Um, NAS is committed to providing timely, accurate, and useful statistics in service to U.S. agriculture through reports and surveys. So as we talked about, the ARC PLC program it is a safety net program. We have heard, had a lot of heartburn from our farmers about this program because the way that it is administered and whether or not it provides a payment to our farmers is based on these NAS surveys. So it, this pro, the ARC PLC program was designed to come into play when yields were low, you know, prices, uh, were low and things like that. So when farmers, farmers are, asked are asked to complete the NAS surveys, surveys they're, they're asked about the their yields that they have. Okay, farmers, farmers are very, very competitive and they may not realize the importance of this survey and they may not want to say that they didn't have a very good yield. So they just say, you know, they say they had a good yield and give a phenomenal number. Well, then really they didn't, and when it comes time for these counties to process payments for our PLC, their county doesn't trigger for a payment. Well, then they're complaining about why didn't it trigger? Well, because you said that your yields were great, so there's no need for this compensation. So it becomes a little bit of a problem. So it's very important that mass surveys are accurately filled out and folks take advantage of that. And it helps our beginning farmers because we're able to design programs to help them potentially or, or pick up, you know, realize where the importance is and where farmers really need help and need compensation. So uh, it's something that's very, very important. And so from, the, we also have, they do the, um, um, the Census of Agriculture. Yes, every five years. So 2012 was a census year, 2017 is a census year. And it's very important that those are filled out and fill that accurately as well because from the last census that's where it was determined that there were 20 fewer beginning farmers than there were in 2007. So as we saw we were on that um, that decline and as we saw the average age of the farmer continuing to increase which is now 58.3 years old her, um, local is probably about 68 years old you know there needed to be something done about this so that's where we picked up you know they realized that USDA that you know an initiative needed to be set out for our beginning farmers to raise awareness about these programs that are available at USDA we like to say that there is a place for everyone at USDA just you have to find that place um, so our programs are there they're available and that's what we're trying to do and hopefully um, from the 2017 census, we will see an increase in our beginning farmer participation uh, from that. So they are, they are a very, very important agency to USDA. Another sister agency is the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And these folks open doors for new and beginning farmers. They are a technical assistant and they provide financial uh, needs as well. So we like to tell folks to go visit NRCS. If you've bought a farm, you're not sure what you want to do on that farm, you're not sure what you're eligible for, go visit NRCS in your local county and they'll come out to your farm for free, go over it with you and see what programs you may qualify for. Their biggest program is probably the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, the EQUIP program. Uh, there, the High Tunnel Program for Fruit and Vegetable Growers, which is a cost share program, 
uh, is available. They have, if you're a cattle farmer, they help you to install water for your cattle. Uh, cross fencing, they don't, they don't do perimeter fencing, but cross fencing, they help you to reseed your fields if you need uh, help with that. So those are cost share programs available, and it is a competitive process. And if you're a beginning farmer, if you're underserved, you receive incentives and priorities. They, they call their categories historically underserved. Um, so there is, there is some advantages there. Um, we mentioned the conservation activity plan earlier. That's to help our folks who are interested in organic and to help them transition. So there's some, there's some cost share available there as well. NRCS has got a website for their folks to utilize there through the NRCS Gateway website. You can track your applications. Um, through that website as well. Agricultural Marketing Service, AMS. Uh, they provide the agriculture industry with valuable tools and services that help to create marketing opportunities. So not only do we try to help beginning farmers individually through this initiative, we uh, try to help our rural areas uh, as well, and to help our communities to prosper and to help them uh, with economic development. So. Um, AMS administers the Farmers Market and Local Food Promotion Program. Now these are grants as well, and it's really hard, you know, if you're an individual, you can't really do that. So your farmers market needs to come together, your individuals, your members of that market, and they apply for these grants because they're out there um, and they're, they're very good and can be very effective in your areas. Um, also, they provide cost share programs for organic certification as well. Know your farmer, know your food. This was an initiative from 2009 um, that was set aside. Now, as we see the transition in administration, some of these initiatives, the names may change, so we want to point that out. But this is talking about local foods, um, you know, supporting, once again, this is a great way to support your community, support your region by buying local foods. As we see more people become interested in healthy foods and where their foods come from. We have folks, you know, wanting to sell to local hospitals, to local schools, things like that. Um, and again, they're at farmers markets. Then this is this is a great thing to do uh, in your area is have local foods. And urban agriculture, uh, when I started this program, so I'm from South Central Kentucky. So farming to me is corn, tobacco, soybeans, beef, dairy, poultry, things like that. So going, into this position and learning about urban agriculture has opened a whole new understanding uh, to things. When we were in Washington, D.C., one of my counterparts, um, she talked about, she was from, she covered North Carolina, Virginia area. Um, she was from Maryland, and she was talking about her fiance, how he was in the military. He got out, he didn't really have a clue what he was going to do. So he really struggled at making a living. So he went to California and he was farming on a rooftop, living in a tent. And I just kind of looked at her and I said, what? I'm like, that's not even farming, that's gardening or something. So she classified him as a hippie farmer. Um, so we have those and it's emerging um, in Nashville. Um, you know, Louisville, Kentucky was on the list that we received and you know, evolved in urban agriculture. It's something that's, you know, here, it's something we don't typically think about. And at the Farm Service Agency, you know, as I talked about that farm serial number, this is something we have ran into. How do we delineate the property and assign a farm serial number to a building in downtown Nashville? So, um, our folks were trying to become really creative and, you know, I'm sure that this is being addressed, but that, that's a problem that we've ran into, but, you know, our food is being supplied in this manner. Also, the high tunnels, you know, they're popping up in urban areas, um, so that's something as well. So here we're trying to be really become equipped and embrace this at uh, USDA. Risk Management Agency. So we all know about insurance agents within our area. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. Uh, question on the urban um, mm -hmm. area. The, um, I saw the high tunnel program there. Mm -hmm. I have a neighbor that he's got farms, gardens, fields <laughs> all over all over the, the county, um, growing vegetables for um, I guess they're uh, for the poor basically mm -hmm. uh, for for the church. And would he qualify as a beginning farmer? He's been doing this for three years. He potentially could. Yes. Okay. He wants a high tunnel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> He's really, really looking forward to getting one uh -huh. because he wants the people that are they're feeding to yes. participate. Uh -huh. 
in, in growing up? He would need to go to his local FSA office. Um, if he doesn't own the land, that is okay. If he is renting it or someone's letting him utilize it, then that owner, they'll have a farm serial number. If they don't, they can take the deed in, get it established because he'll have to have a farm serial number uh, to get started and to take part in that program. Um, so yeah, you, so you don't necessarily know. He wouldn't have, you spoke about him having different spots of land and stuff, different gardens that, yeah, um, he needs to go to his local office and inquire about it. And they can, they can provide him with the information there. That kind of follow-up question, but it's not really it. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to get the young farmer alone, uh, okay. I know a lot of the government programs, like you aren't eligible for if you farm wetlands. Uh -huh. So if young farmer loans, those type of things, is that actually deal? Like yes, way? you have to be in compliance. Okay. Staying in compliance, compliance and conservation service, service through NRCS, yeah, it's very important. Yeah. You have to be in compliance. I'm not that with, yeah, following up with your first question. He will classify for NRCS. High tone uh -huh. and that will classify for 75% up to 90% if he's a beginner farmer, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a reimbursement program. Yes. So he will have to spend the money and they will give him the money later on. That's how yes. it is. Right? Yes, it's a cost share program. Yeah, you have to set the money up front. <laughs> Keep your receipt. And once you're completed, you, once you're completed in, you take it in and they'll reimburse you with your money. So, yeah. So that's how that works. Okay, okay, so risk management. Um, operates and manages the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation. Um, private sector insurance, as we mentioned, you know, we have these all over our areas, but it is all headed up by the risk management agency. And so I really like to point out the reason that um, risk management agency and our insurance is so, so important. Um, it's, it's been very important through this Farm Bill from 2014 as they work on the 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, you know, we're, we're anxiously awaiting to get that, but uh, insurance has been very important. It's very important to our farmers, to our producers, because there are many, many risks involved in farming. So one of those being production. So you don't know from year to year what your crops are going to do, your commodities. So it's very important to have insurance for that purpose. Price or market, uh, from the time you purchase your inputs until you get ready to sell, you don't know what the market's going to do. Uh, so it's important for that reason. Financial, you don't know if you're going to be able to get, the, get a loan. Uh, for the year that you're needing it for, or things may change. So that's something to keep in mind. Institutional report, referring to the government. Um, you know, with the government, there are several regulations at times, so you never know um, what's going to happen there. And the human or personal things we don't like to think about or mention, unfortunately. Um, you know, things go under control, control, we could get sick, and things such as that happen. So uh, insurance is important for those reasons. So as we talk about rural development, which we mentioned earlier, it's another agency with the USDA um, helping to commit, helping, they're committed to helping improve the economy and quality of life in rural America. They work much like the Farm Service Agency through the loan program. However, the Farm Service Agency is designed primarily to help with farmland and uh, real estate, your farming operations. Rural development is to help folks uh, purchase homes or build homes in rural areas. So they're more in the housing. Uh, category, which at FSA we can potentially, you know, if you're buying a farm and, you know, the house is on there, things like that, but we can't just say, you know, we have folks call and say, you know, can you help me purchase a house? Well, that falls into rural development in their role, and that's what they're here for. They have a direct and guarantee program as well. So the value-added producer grant that we talked about a little bit earlier, um, this is anything if you're adding value to your product. So as we mentioned organics, um, we mentioned you know, if you're raising tomatoes, you're making salsa, you're doing ketchup, you're doing berries, and you're making jam, things like that. Anything to add value to your product. Um, in this grant, there, there are time frames uh, when you can sign up for that. I don't know that the, um, the opening, date has, opening date has come yet for Tennessee. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. However, However, you can, you can start, working on, your start working on your application and have it ready you know, when that program, program does open up. It, it is a competitive process as well. And they have a beginning farmer division um, there as well. So that gives you some uh, foot in the door also through that program. Then the Rural Energy for America program, the REAP program, anything to improve energy. So energy efficient improvements. 
Uh, that can be made um, if you have got a shop building and you want to do LED lighting, they help with those type of things, geothermal heating and cooling, and things like that. Those programs are available. And they also have a business program uh, to help with financial and technical assistance in, as you start your business. So that's what rural development does. And then USDA, um, embracing women in agriculture. We're seeing more and more women become involved in agriculture, whether they're working on the farm or they're working in the agricultural industry. Um, I know at USDA, we have a huge number of ladies who work there. So, and they are in management management roles, they're in leadership roles, and things such as that. So we're really trying to embrace them as much as possible. And here you can see nearly 1 million women are working in America's land, which is approximately one third of our nation's farm so women are involved in every aspect of agriculture so we're really trying to embrace them um, and support them as they enter in uh, to agriculture it's really connecting the stem program science technology engineering math uh, relating that to agriculture and getting them involved there so the veterans uh, veterans program much like the beginning farmers uh, incentives and priorities are available to them uh, once again any programs not just specific specifically designed for veterans they're not specifically designed for beginning farmers anyone can participate but um, if you fall into those categories then there's incentives and priorities that go along with it um, a lot of folks think you know, a lot of the veterans say that farming is therapeutic to them because they're still being able to provide a service to their community uh, to their country by supplying with food or working the land with their hands and things such as that so um, we like to say they had a mission to protect, now they have a mission to provide. And the Small Business Administration is one of our great partners who help with the veterans. Uh, they have a Veterans Business Outreach Center, which helps, which center, which helps with business training, counseling, mentoring. Um, also, we also have help with the transition assistance, so transitioning from, uh, sub, um, from service life into civilian life. And I would like to add to that uh, the National Agribility Project. They really uh, reach out, work. they have a beginning farmer and a veteran program as well. So, you know, if you have a veteran who is disabled, then they make accommodations to and modifications to equipment to assist them in their farming operation if need be. Uh, so that program is available and those folks are there as a resource as well. So here as we think about wrapping up our new farmers, um, really they touch everyone in all aspects, you know, our schools, university, non-government organizations, consumers, markets, ag businesses, state and local government. Um, so as a whole, you know, they definitely impact our rural America and all of their communities as a whole. So we're really just trying to embrace them at USDA, provide programs that are there for them because they're there. So we encourage them to take advantage of them. Um, and so that wraps up the presentation on the programs about USDA. Um, there's my contact information if you all have any questions about anything, hopefully. Yeah. And I know it was a lot of information, but you understand more about USDA and what we do. Um, so I know I understand we have some graduates in the room. Are y'all, how many, what, are, what age group are we at? Folks who are ready to go out into the workforce or you're, you're almost there. <laughs> okay. So uh, anyone interested in working for USDA? Yes, yes, we are under a freeze right now. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, just if you all are interested, if you saw something that's appealing to you at a special agency that you think, hey, that's really neat, I like what they do. Uh, USA Jobs is where the jobs are posted. You know, it's unknown when that hiring freeze will be lifted. Uh, typically, you know, this is typical with new transition, new administration coming on board. It usually happens. So. Um, you know, we just don't know when, but, you know, I encourage folks, it's a great uh, opportunity if you're interested in agriculture or if you don't even, we have folks who have no farming background who work for us. Um, so I had a counterpart and I was a farm loan officer. She was a veteran. I grew up in the city and never been on a farm in her life. Uh, literally, they had to teach her what a cow or wool was, tell her what a hay rake was, tell her what a bush hog was, things like that. So, you know, I mean, it, it's a... Um, it's a good experience, it's a good exposure, but she loves what she does and um, it's been very successful at it, so. Amanda, as, I mean, I know there's not much to say within your administration, but uh -huh. as far as funds being available, mm -hmm. for example, 
Well, so I want to start with a high tone note. Mm -hmm. They want to sign up for the NRCA. Mm -hmm. Are those funds are going to be impacted? Because uh, I know from county to county, county. there, mm -hmm. there's very little you know, resources that are going to apply. Are you guys aware that? Like, I don't want to call the call. Yes, they can go ahead and call and inquire, and I can't say whether or not their funds are available or they've opened up that sign up yet. Uh, and I, it's my understanding that each state varies, so um, you know I'm not sure. They just need to call and inquire. Uh, you know, with the understanding that hey, we are in a transition. You know, I'm not sure what's going on. Can you provide me with any insight? So I would take that approach to it. Um, you know, we get into that funding issue as we talked about the farm loans. Currently, there's money available there. At times, you know, our funding becomes limited uh, depending on because so much is allocated each year. Um, so you know, depending on those situations. But you know, I would just have folks call and inquire about it. Call their local office. The other question is in ways in the same one of our in service trainings. Uh, somebody mentioned that they are, the number of phone calls they receive from veterans in that area has increased and they get aggravated because uh, they want to start farming by the way, farming by the way, but they don't know, they don't know what it takes to start farming. farming. Mm -hmm. so, so where will you direct is currently we don't have, we have one publication that we published this year that's for food and vegetable beginner farmers. Mm -hmm. But we do not currently have a publication on uh, livestock and other crops. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what would you recommend um, when the extension agents send these phone calls? Mm -hmm. Where would you send them? Um, of course, we would offer them, tell them, explain our programs to them. Mm -hmm. uh, but also the Small Business Administration, where, where they, they did. yeah. Okay. Um, they typically, they have got a specific veteran business center there, outreach center. Um, so they may be able to provide more insight or be able to accommodate them, you know, more fully. Because as I said, we do not have any, programs, not have any specifically programs specifically designed for veterans. They're open, They're open to everyone and everyone can participate. Yeah, However, you know, we spe place special, special emphasis on them. Um, yes. Is there a minimum age for getting a not real. I mean, I say yes and I say no. Since starting this, um, you know, generally if it was just a house and a lot, but you, we would, you know, not say no, you don't have to do that. But if you're going to do, you know, backyard garden, if you're going to start to have an operation there, then I would encourage you to go into your office, take your deed, and let them establish your farm serial number. Because if you want to participate, as we said, in the high tunnel program, you're going to have to have a farm serial number. Do they have to have a two years experience before getting the PIN number? Or no, do that no, you do that first. And take your survey in if you have a survey with your property, because that helps them to be able to get your um, acreage delineated out more accurately. Because otherwise, they're just reading the deed and trying to, you know, follow the lines. If it's not something that's been previously established. Now, if you purchase a farm from someone and you purchase all that they have, then it, that's kind of easy. They just change that over into your name. Uh, if, if it's divided up, then they go in and do what they call a reconstitution and divide that farm and then create you a new farm member uh, from that. So there's different different avenues there. But no, you do not have to have that. That's how you get established into the system. It's just going in there. And that should be your first stop, so that's a good question. But no, you don't have to have the experience to get a farm member. When did the next census of eight uh, I don't know when they will come out. The census is done. I think it will go out in December of 2017. I think it will be mailed out in December. So it could be a while. Well, I can definitely tell you that it has, but how much, I don't, I know in Kentucky and Tennessee, just from polling, what we have done, the specific programs that we have done, we increased by 8-9% in about 10 months. 8-9% to 9 in 10 months. So from January, when we started this, I started in the position like January 25th, and at the end of September, when I polled Kentucky, Tennessee, and did a, a survey on it, it was about 8 to 9 What kind of high egg, or do you think that's a, do you think it's more like organic, like urban farming, that you're getting more interesting? Well, the farm loan program has opened a lot of doors, and it's really probably, you know, just folks taking advantage of that. So it could be, you know, it depends on what, area you look at specifically. 
because each county is different. It varies from your various areas across the two states, across the region. Okay, so funding wise, do you see this as a vulnerable area at all? Yes. Okay. I think it's. it's um, on that note, question. Do you guys have a um, study from 2015 showing that beginner farmers have lower survival rates mm -hmm. than established farms? And mm -hmm. that's just based on 2007 and 2012. Mm -hmm. What have you identified? Is it a matter of resources uh, or lack of experience, lack of information, lack of training? What, how do you have used that information to change the program so that you can increase the viral rates? I think really getting the message out. So just spreading the word, you know, through outreach, you know, doing presentations, talking to various groups, and then just by word of mouth, it travels. Uh, so I think because so many folks don't know what USDA can do, they don't know that the Farm Service Agency has low interest loans where we finance 100% or, yeah, you know, they don't know about the cost share program through the high tunnels. They think they have to go out and purchase a high tunnel on their own, and there's nothing there to help them pay for that cost. Uh, so I think just raising awareness about our programs has been huge. Uh, being able to get out and do that. And our county offices do that. They have outreach means, but, you know, they have been limited on what they can do because, you know, they still have to make sure that daily operation at the county office goes on. Uh, so this has enabled us to get out more um, and to focus on special groups and meet with folks who can utilize the program. I have a question just on formal training. Uh -huh. um, when they get loans, we have uh, area farm management specialists quite often work with recipients and since you work in both Tennessee and Kentucky I was wondering is it still that three-year window in both locations and is there any thought on moving that up so that you're getting more training on the front end rather than having people wait until year three and then say okay now I should now I should plan, I should plan and plan by that time I'm the worst kind of out of yeah and I would like to say that I appreciate what y'all are doing I think it's great um you know, this has been something that has been a concern for me coming from being a farm loan officer. I see, um, you know, borrowers get hung up on that training. Um, and it is quite intensive if they order the online, online materials. Uh, it, can, it can be very overwhelming to them. So I think what you guys are doing are, is very important. And that is something, you know, there's pros and cons to it, you know. Um, I think it would be good to have some, which I understand you all do some classroom training as well as some one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. We um, do have a, we have an ongoing classroom training mm -hmm. for so we've done one classroom we're doing six sites in the state. We yeah. last year and we finished It's so, just a short term program. Okay, so yeah, getting that training up front would be very beneficial, especially to our beginning farmers, you know, kind of help them be like, you know, you guys, since you all come out, you work one-on-one -on -one with them, sit down with them, it could be very, very beneficial to them. Yeah, because I know one of the, the biggest concerns that we get from the area farm specialists is they wait until year three to complete that training. Quite often their options have already been reduced substantially as the teacher that loan is going to be repaid. Yes. Uh, so there's a huge risk factor. And I understand you work by flexibility, mm -hmm. but my thought would be at least getting that initial meeting as mandatory mm -hmm. in front end rather than yeah. Than three. Yeah, that is a good thought. So and thanks for that input because it's good to hear that feedback on the way you guys have the program designed. Um, so yeah, I'll pass that news along to them. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah, no questions. Okay. Okay.